So you started doing some CTFs and maybe even gotten an initial foothold on a machine, but you don't have full access over it. You got a user flag, but you still need that juicy root flag. In this video, I'm going to show you the common attack vectors that hackers use to escalate privileges on Linux machines. Let's get started. I will be using TryHackMe's Linux Privilege Escalation Room for some examples throughout the video. As always, links and commands will be pasted in the description. Part 1. Pseudo. One of the most common vulnerabilities I see on easy CTFs are pseudo misconfigurations. Pseudo is used to execute commands as root. You've probably already figured this out as you need to use it to connect to a VPN. The etc sudoers file is an important file. It defines who can execute specific commands with elevated privileges. We can see this for our current user. We will run sudo l and we can see all the commands that Karen can run with elevated privileges. We can see this all, meaning all users, even root, we can run with no password prompt, we can run find, less, and nano. To know which binaries are vulnerable, we can head to GTFO bins and search for them, such as find, and we see sudo here, and there's this one-liner here that will elevate us to root. We can simply just paste that one-liner in, and just like that, we're root. It's that easy. Part 2. SUID, or set user identification files, allows the file to be executed with the permission level of its owner. Running ls-l will show the permissions of a file or directory. If you don't understand permission structures, I'm going to go over that right now. Now, this is what it looks like, and we're going to go over it one step at a time. Now, we're going to look at the very first bit. Typically, you'll either see a D or a dash. The dash just means file, and the D just means directory. Simple as that. Now for the rest of this, we need to look at it in three separate groups. We'll take the first part, and this represents the permissions of the file owner. RWX. This simply means read, write, and execute. The owner has permission to read the file, the owner has permission to write over the file, like change its contents, and X means the owner can execute the file. Now the second group is very similar, but this is for a specified group. The specified pebble group can read it and execute it, but does not have write permissions over the file. And the last part is for others. We can see that everyone else can only read the file. Can't write, can't execute it. Now let's take a look at suid. A suid bit is represented by replacing the owner's execute bit with an s. A sgid, or set group id, is the exact same thing but for a group. Again, a suid, meaning we can execute the file as its owner, or an SGID, meaning we can execute the file as a specific group. All right, so let's see this in action. We can paste in this command, and this will show us all files that have a SUID or SGID bit set. And we can see base64 here uh, has a SUID bit for root. So it's always good to compare these against GTFO bins. We can check base64, and we see that there is a SUID function here, and if we can execute base64's root, we can essentially read any file. We can base64 encode the file, and then pipe it into base64 again and decode it. One of the most valuable files on a Linux system is the etc shadow file, which keeps password hashes of users. Since we know we can execute base64's root, let's try and exploit this. We use base64, and then the etc shadow file, pipe it into base64 again, dash d, to decode it. This is going to encode it, this is just going to decode it, and we should, there we go, just be able to read that file and see all the hashes of these users. Part 3. Cron jobs. Cron jobs are used to run scripts or commands every so often at a set time frequency. An administrator may use a cron job to create a backup every night during downtime. Any user can read the system-wide cron jobs under etc cron tab. And we can see that antivirus, uh, this antivirus bash script, and this backup script, and this test.python file is being run by root uh, every minute. But some cron jobs are not easily visible to all users. The tool pspy can be used to snoop on processes as they are executed. I recommend running this instead of relying on the cron tab file. So this script is being run by root every minute or so, and if we can modify that script, then we can basically execute arbitrary commands as root. We can do ls-l 
and then the file to see our permissions over it. In Karen, the owner of the file has write permissions over it. All right, so let's add some malicious code to the script. Um, Echo will just will just write out the contents of what's ever in the, in the parentheses, and then we'll do the greater than sign to add it to a file, or we'll do it two times to append it, so the script still runs and we don't ruin whatever's going on in there. To this bash script, and we'll put in a reverse shell from revshells.com right there. And all we need to do is wait for that to execute and we'll set up our own listener on the same port, port 443, and just wait. Okay, so I've waited about like five minutes and I still haven't gotten a rev shell. Um, I just catted the actual script and the reason this may not be executing is because this zipping may be throwing an error, it may be taking a while. So we're just gonna cut the rest of this out, but keep the bin bash, the shebang big ba bin bash to um, execute this as bash, and we'll put that back there. So I'm just gonna run this again. Um, I'll just put in shebang slash bin slash bash. And then we don't want to append it. We just want to overwrite it. So now if we cat the file, we just get, oh, I forgot the slash. Bin bash, there we go. And we also want to add our rev shell there. So now hopefully we will get a rev shell and it doesn't get hung on this backup stuff. Never mind. I didn't even realize the file wasn't executable. Um, that's all the problem. So we can, we can modify it since we're the owner of it. We'll do chmod plus x, the file, there we go, and now we will just wait, and you can also see ls-l this, now we can see it is executable, so hopefully the cron job should execute it as root, and there we go, right, who am I? We are root just like that. Part 4, automation. Now listen, listen close. This whole thing can be automated. Yeah. All those weird commands we ran, they can be automated with a tool called Linpees. Now then why would I tell you about all that stuff previously? Well, this leads into my next segment, but the point is that you get a deep understanding of the exploits at hand. Automation will only help so much. You need a deep understanding of the vulnerabilities to utilize automation effectively. We can install the Pease tools with sudo apt install and dash y so that we don't get any confirmations there we go and it's already installed so I don't have to go through all that and it'll be installed in user share keys slash here we go linpees and winpees lin for windows win f or sorry lin for linux win for windows we'll use linux and we'll just do linpees.sh um, and we will copy this to our current directory there we go and we will set up a python reverse shell with python dash m http server 80. there we go so now this is being hosted on a website and we can download this on the target machine i'll head to the temporary directory and i'll use curl to download it http and then our p which is in the top right 242 slash sh and dash o to output it I'll just call it linpeace.sh. And I also need to mark it as executable. And now we can run linpeace. And this will show a bunch of stuff. Here we can see the cron jobs and we see the vulnerable file right here. I'm sure this is also vulnerable. And here we can also see sudo-l. And almost always I find that sudo-l doesn't work on linpeace. So again, it's always good to do it manually. And it'll also show suid binaries. Now here's a tip for all my guys trying to move past the easy level CTFs. The strategy is to think outside the box. Half the time, Linpeace doesn't explicitly tell you the privesc vector, and you need to think. You need to do complete enumeration and research to find anything fishy. Looking for non-default files, scripts, and services, and figuring out a way to exploit them is key. But most importantly, it takes time. It takes a lot of practice and note-taking to learn what to look for when doing CTFs. But this was just the surface. If you want to practice these, do the Try Hack Me Room link in the description. Or if you want to see some of these techniques used in a real CTF, click this video right here. I hope you guys have learned something new. I will see you guys in the next one. Stay elite and peace.